Hello guys, good afternoon. I will start my lecture now. Um, we will tackle up chapter 15 to 17. So this is a collaborative lecture with Purdue University. So most of the students are under Purdue University. And the hands-on training is facilitated by Arabic and Indian Manifassacre or business. So you can verify my um, credentials or information at www.fordu.edu slash directory. You can input my name and all details will be uh, given to you. So I'm your lecturer. Um, I'm Mr. Janja Cabrillos. I'm a registered nurse, both DHA and DOH of Abu Dhabi. PRCSP under ESHAMS, RPO and OSH General Industry under OSHA. So we will start to talk about um, low temperature sterilization. Low temperature sterilization um, are available for those instruments that are not capable of handling um, heat and too much um, steam. Okay, or for these are items that are heat and moisture sensitive instruments. So are used for heat and moisture sensitive instruments. So let's remember the basic requirements, which is same seat, actually, um, so that it can, it can be easy to memorize. You can pronounce it as safe as Okay, remember the basic requirements, which is same or safe or pronounced as safe, so that it's easier for you to remember. For same, it's safety. So low level serialization should be, um, should follow safety guidelines. So safety. Adaptability for A. So material compatibility, it should be compatible with any instruments or any materials in CSSB. Materials compatibility. E for efficacy, it's effectiveness for a certain equipment. Not all um, equipment are uh, not all equipment are are capable in low sterilization methods. Efficacy. So as for sterilization performance.
wait for approval. Wait for penetration. for exposure monitoring. Okay. By remembering the basic requirements, you can easily remember by abbreviating it with same state. Okay. Safety adaptability, material compatibility, efficacy, serialization, performance, approval, penetration, and exposure monitoring. So this is the this, your basic requirements, safety, adaptability, material compatibility, efficacy, serialization, performance, monitoring. Approval, penetration, and exposure monitoring. Okay, for um, low sterilization methods, you have EHO. So I abbreviate it as EHO. So you can abbreviate it as OHE or same spelling of one. Okay. So that you can easily understand. I you can easily remember that. Those sterilization methods, EHO, and your ethylene oxide or your EPO, your hydrogen peroxide, your H2O2, or your ozone, ozone or your ozone sterilization. So for your low sterilization methods, one or OHE, you need to remember the abbreviation of OHE for one. Okay. From the word one, just change the middle letter, which is N to H, so that you can easily remember the low sterilization method. So the low sterilization method is your OHE or EHO, as we tackled that earlier. This slide. So OHE is your ozone, hydrogen, and ethylene oxide. So I abbreviate this as one, the same as spelled with one. So you just change, just change this one, so that we can easily remember. Okay, for low sterilization, okay, this is your OHE. For your ozone, hydrogen peroxide or gas plasma, and ethylene oxide. So I abbreviate it as OHE or 1. Please remember that ozone is 0 0.1. First, from the lowest to your highest, which is 1, 1. 0 0.1 ppm, 1.0 1 ppm, and 1.0 ppm. Okay. That's your OSHA PEL or permissible exposure limit. While your NIOSH or um, immediate danger to health and life, it is also um, from lowest to highest. Okay, it is increasing. From lowest, from lowest, it is increasing. So it will start with 5 ppm, 5, 7, 8, so 5 ppm, 7, 75 ppm, and 800 ppm. So all of your low sterilization method, they, 
they have monitoring, which is for your OSHA, it's PEL and IDHL for NIOSH. So it should not be beyond 0 0.1 ppm for ozone, for hydrogen peroxide should be um, not beyond 1.0 ppm, and the same with your ethanol oxide, not be beyond 1.0 ppm. Okay, for low sterilization, there are only one sterilization method that has a monitoring. Okay, this is your ethanol oxide. The same with radiation, okay. your x ray machine, the healthcare facility, they are wearing a dosimeter badge. So, your ethylene oxide also, they are wearing an ethylene, um, ethylene oxide badge. Okay, it's a dosimeter badge for ethylene oxide. So, for ozone, there's no monitoring, no monitoring for ozone, hydrogen peroxide, no monitoring. And then outside, yes, there is, there is some monitoring. Okay, as we can remember, okay, um, as we can remember the word one, okay, one. Let's change the middle to H so that we can easily uh, remember the low sterilization method. And don't forget the one. Okay. It, so your for your ozone, it's 0 0.1 ppm. For your hydrogen peroxide, it's 1.0 ppm. For your ethylene oxide, it's 1.0 ppm. It is actually um, increasing from lowest to okay. so, So from 0 0.1, it will increase to 1.0 and 1.0. For NIOSH, IDHL, as, I re as you can see, I told you before, it's 5.70. Okay, so 5 ppm, 7 ppm, 5.70, okay, but please, uh, so that you will not you will not forget. Um, you need to put the five up. Okay, it should be seven five ppm. Okay, and for eight is. Eight hundred ppm for monitoring. There's no monitoring for your ozone. No monitoring for your hydrogen peroxide, and yes, there is monitoring for your ethylene oxide. So for low serialization methods for penetration, please remember the EA and HOO. I put a logo which is EA Games, which is actually a brand for a PlayStation games. And HOHO is your Santa Claus. Okay. So EA for ethylene oxide or, or your ethylene. The penetration is called alkylation. Okay, alkylation means seeking specific protein to inactivate 
microbes. So during acclimation process, your EPO destroys the cell's ability to metabolize or reproduce, which leads to organism death. So for your hydrogen peroxide and ozone, that's why I put HOO, it's hydrogen and ozone is, the term is oxidation. So the process of oxidizing, which adds oxygen to a compound with a loss of electrons. So it will add oxygen, actually it's oxygen plus H2O. It will combine and then it will add to a compound. So it can um, lead to a organism death. Okay, don't forget your EA and HOO or HOOO for your, um, so that you can easily remember them for your uh, penetration of low sterilization methods. So low sterilization methods, ethylene oxide gas is one of your um, samples. This is your ethylene oxide sterilizer. So there are times that your ethylene oxide uh, machine, the same, uh, looks like the same with your autoclave. So you need to check for it if it is autoclave or if it is PTO or hydrogen peroxide. Okay. So please be remember that um, your ethylene oxide, since it is low sterilization method, it, it will run to a um, low boiling point of 10.7, which it, it will uh, boil on 10 degrees Celsius. And the maximum um, uh, temper, uh, the temperature, for, the working temperature for ethylene oxide is 37 to 63 degrees Celsius. So your, your ethylene oxide is a low boiling point, 10.7 degrees Celsius. Its operating temperature is 37 degrees Celsius to 63 degrees Celsius. So the exposure time of your ethylene oxide is actually one to six hours. This is your sample of your um, gas canister or gas cartridge or ethylene, ox ethylene oxide. Aeration time is eight to 12 hours, okay? So aeration means moving air to facilitate removal of toxic residuals after exposure to ethyl. Um, ethylene oxide is a toxic gas. So aeration are moving air to facilitate to removal from the chamber of toxic residuals after exposure. Once it is exposed with ETO, um, then aeration are made at the last part. Okay, it will evacuate, it will facilitate removal of toxic residuals. So the gas concentration of ethylene oxide is 450 to 450 milligram, milligrams per liter. To 1,200 milligrams per liter. Okay, if you are um, if the aeration time is eight hours, okay, the the temperature for this is sixty degrees Celsius. For 12 hours, it's 50 degrees Celsius. So, so, so for aeration time, the lower the aeration time, the higher the temperature is. So 8 hours is equivalent to 60 degrees Celsius 
well for your 12 hours it equivalents to 50 degrees Celsius. Duration time of eight or sixteen degrees Celsius or one fourteen uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, Twelve hours is equivalent to fifty degrees Celsius or one twenty two degrees Fahrenheit. So this is your sample of your ETO machine. Okay. Usually the canister is or the cartridge here. So for ethylene oxide, as we discussed earlier, that there is a monitoring. So this is your sample of your dosimeter. There's a little chip inside. Uh, this badge or your dosimeter badge, and you will send it at the end of your testing or at the end of the day um, for the test for the end date where you need to um, send this for testing. You need to send a small chip to the laboratory for evaluation. For evaluation in DB. So, this is your dosimeter for EPO. So ethyl oxide, as you can see in the can canister of the ETO, it has a lot of um, images. Okay, for this logo, it means that the canister is a gas cylinder with pressure. So it's a pressurized gas cylinder. For your um, for this logo, it says uh, the canister is flammable for fire hazard. For this logo, if you can see in any of your chemicals with this logo, it means it can cause death or toxicity in short exposure. Well, for this one, it means health hazard, which is the chemicals is carcinogen or which can uh, lead cancerous, uh, to cancer cells, reproductive toxicity, and aspiration toxicity. So as you can remember in our previous lecture, all departments are all positive um, pressure air pressure. So your decontamination is negative air pressure. Okay, just a moment, guys. I need to check if there's a password to the link because
So your for low sterilization method, ethylene oxide, um, it has has um, special requirements for pressure air. So as you can remember in our previous uh, lecture, okay, for your uh, decontamination room, it should have a negative air pressure, which means in the contamination room, your um, it will contain whatever um, bacteria inside it cannot go out or it cannot escape. So for other areas in CSSB, which is your uh, prep and pack for general areas, let's say general areas, your um, serial storage or serialization room, prep and pack should have a positive air pressure. So for your um, for your sterilization room, supposedly if it's only a uh, autoclave, it should have a positive air pressure. But if you are using an ETO, your ETO should be uh, placed in a different room which is your ETO should be negative air pressure. But if you're using only autoclave, then your serialization loop should only be, it uh, should only have uh, positive air pressure. But if you have um, ETO, you're using ETO it should be separated with negative air pressure. The reason why, um if in case there is a environmental hazard happen which a leak of your ETO, it cannot contaminate it, it cannot contaminate other room or other area in your facility. So low sterilization method ETO cannot be used on the following liquids, devices with energy, or battery operated devices, leather items. So it cannot be used to them. So low sterilization packaging need to be for, um, for low sterilization, it's polypropylene. This is your example of your profit, uh, polypropylene. So for your ethylene oxide packaging, either um, 
polypropylene uh, packaging, they are also applicable uh, or compatible packaging for ETO, which is your medical clip paper. We need to distinguish what is the difference with the medical clip paper, uh, polypropylene, muslin wrap, because they are look the same. So another uh, packaging, which is your paper plastic, which is the Tyvek. Okay, as, I, as you can remember in our previous lecture, Tyvek should supposedly with hats or the hat, hydrogen ozone Tyvek spun bound, but it can be used with ethyl oxide. So for low sterilization methods, for biological, um, for biological indicator, there are two types of bacteria used. It's uh, cultured bacteria uh, impregnated in a filter paper inside the vial. Okay. Um, for ETO, it is Geobacillus atropius, which is originally the color medium is green. So it, it will change to yellow for the control for the process it will remain green for autoclave hydrogen peroxide and ozone it should be purple medium which is geobacillus stearothermophilus which the same um the same color once it is the control or once um it has a positive growth it will turn to yellow while your um well, if it, uh, it, if it this doesn't change to color, which is the purple, it means that um, there is no positive growth on the, uh, on the bacteria. So let's uh, watch the sample of traits from 3M disinfection and sterilization. So it's the um, biological incubator with both ETO and uh, the Geobacillus atropius and the Geobacillus thearothermophilus.
So please remember, okay, I will just repeat for this one. Um, there are two biological indicators used in CSSP, which is your geobacillus atropius and your geobacillus stearothermobilus. For your ETO, it's atropius. The color video is green. While your geobacillus stearothermobilus, the color medium is purple. So from, for your ETO, or your ethylene oxide sterilization, um, from the purple medium of green, the control is from green, it will change to yellow. So once it, it, it remains to the color green, it means the, there's no bacterial growth. So in your geobacillus stearothermophilus, it's the color medium is purple. So the control is yellow. The reason why it, it turns to yellow for control because you did not process it. You did not put it in the sterilization. So for process, it will change from purple to purple. It will stay the same. It means once it, it stays the original color medium, um, it means that there is no bacterial growth. So this is um, a video is coming from 3M, Disinfection and Sterilization. So you can have an overview with the uh,
So the video actually shows for automatic reading. But if you are doing it manually, so once you once you place a biological indicator in an autoclave or ETO machine, okay. Um, so once you uh, put a biological indicator inside an ETO. Which means it is a process. Whatever you put inside a, ster a sterilant or a sterilization machine, either autoclave, PTO, ozone, hydro hydrogen peroxide, once you put it, once you put a biological indicator inside, it means it is process. Okay. Whatever your control means, you did not put any biological indicator inside autoclave. So you will test if it will change to yellow because it is your control. You, you need to check if the bacteria is viable or not. Okay. For example, for ETO, the, the color medium is green. So if it is changed to yellow, it means it is positive, which means positive growth. Okay. There's a bacterial growth on the uh, test vial. Okay. For green, for the process one, it remains green, it means negative, which means there's no uh, there's no bacterial growth or there's a negative bacterial growth, okay? Which means that the result is passed, okay? If ever your control doesn't change to yellow, it means it, you need to check Okay, if this control vial, it doesn't change to yellow, you need to check if you already crash or mix the, uh, via, uh, the biological indicator or the biological vial. You need to mix the filter paper inside by crushing it and the green color medium. Okay. The same scenario with your geobacillus stearothermophilus. The color medium is purple. So once the, the control, which means it, the, the geobacillus stearothermophilus biological indicator is not processed, which means you, you did not put it in the autoclave machine, and it turns to yellow, it means positive. Okay. So... For process, you put it in the autoclave, you crush it, and incubate it for 24 hours, and it doesn't change color to yellow, it means it's negative. Okay? So, negative, if it is the same color, which means for the process, it should be expected color for the process should be the same color medium. Okay, expected color for control, it should be yellow. So you're for hydrogen gas plasma, this is your sample. So hydrogen uh, peroxide gas plasma actually it is effective in killing microorganisms including gram positive and negative bacteria. So yeast, fungi, mycobacterium, tuberculosis, or tuberculosis, it is included. It can uh, the hydrogen peroxide can kill those bacteria and viruses. So this is your sample of your uh, hydrogen peroxide machine or steril sterilization machine. In this part, you need to put, okay, you need to place the uh, hydrogen peroxide sterilant. So this is the sample. Actually, this is not allowed, okay? When you are putting um, hydrogen peroxide in a machine, you need to wear you need to wear a gloves. 
you need to wear a chemical resistant glove, which is your green gloves. So this is your um, sterilant, your gas plasma, hydrogen peroxide. So this indicator, it will turn to red. Sometimes it is uh, white or yellow, it will turn to red if there is leakage. Okay. You need to check before opening uh, this box or this package, you need to check if there's leakage, there's dampness, there's wet, you cannot open it. You need to discard it immediately. It means that there is leakage of hydrogen peroxide inside. So this is your sample of your hydrogen peroxide. This is the correct actually, um, procedures in place, uh, placing a hydrogen peroxide sterilant in a um, hydrogen peroxide gas plasma machine. As you can see in the first uh, image I show you, I put an X because you need to wear uh, chemical resistant gloves, which is green, when handling any chemicals, especially hydrogen peroxide. So that's the sample of how to put a cassette of your aqueous hydrogen peroxide sterile in a machine. Okay. So you need to check before opening, you need to wear proper PPE, which is your gloves, which is your um, chemical resistant gloves, your green gloves. Okay. You need to get, read the label if uh, it is expired or not, you need to check the integrity of your packages or packaging, which means you need to check if there is a liquid form 
or any dampness or wet on the package. Aside from that, um, you need to check the light, which sometimes it is color white, sometimes it's color yellow, it will turn to red once there is a leakage. So this is your sample of your vaporized hydrogen peroxide. It is the same, the same concept, but it use a different uh, sterilant, which is your uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide. So for your hydrogen peroxide, it's not compatible with the following liquids, lemon, powder, or cellulose materials. For your packaging, please remember the hacks, which is hydrogen, ozone, Tyvek, and spawn bounded, which is um, spawn bound polypropylene and polyurethane. So that's the accepted, accepted packaging for hydrogen peroxide. So Tyvek and Spanbound, it's acceptable also with your ethylene oxide. So for your hydrogen peroxide gas plasma sterilization, which is the first uh, machine I showed you or the first video, it has a time of 24 to 75 minutes um, cycle, total cycle. For your Temperature cycle, it's 55 degrees Celsius and the concentration of 59 to 95%. So aeration is not required in your hydrogen peroxide gas plasma sterilization. But for your vaporized hydrogen peroxide, it needs an aeration. But your machine will automatically uh, do the aeration uh, process. So the time, it's 28 to 55 minutes, cycle less than 50. The uh, cycle temperature is less than 50 degrees Celsius. Concentration is 59%. So for aeration for hydrogen peroxide, the plasma is not required. Once uh, done, the instrument can be used immediately for hydrogen peroxide. Okay? For hydrogen peroxide, aeration is not required and the instrument can be used immediately. For vaporized, automatically it is aerated and the sterilizer. So it is aerated, but the sterilizer will do the aeration. So for hydrogen peroxide gas plasma, please be reminded to wear PP, which is your chemotherapy graded gloves. So it's either nitrile, latex, or PVC. Depends. As long for night for you need to check for every policy of your facility because sometimes your facility doesn't uh, require or um, don't allow or doesn't allow any use of latex gloves. So for low sterilization methods, this is the sample of your ozone. So for ozone uh, sterilizer, the machine generates medical grade oxygen and water. So it's oxygen and water, and it will oxidize protein and enzymes, and it will react causing death to your bacteria or organism. Okay, um, I will just return back later to the first lecture so that so the cycle temperature of ozone it's thirty point eight degrees Celsius to thirty six degrees Celsius. The ozone con concentration is 59%. The humidity is 85% to 100%. The time, it's longer time, which is 4 hours and 30 minutes.
So the packaging uh, approved for ozone is your aluminum peel pouches and aluminum rigid container. You need to check because not all um, rigid container or aluminum peel pouches may be because there are times that it is not aluminum. So you need to check the uh, IFU of each packages. For example, this one is aluminum um, aluminum peel pouches. There are times that there is, it's not aluminum, it's metal. So metal are not allowed in ozone packaging. Okay. For this one, this is um, this is uh, aluminum. So you need to check if it is if the rigid container or the aluminum peel pack packages is compatible with ozone. So not allowed your woven fabrics and metal foils. So for sterile storage and transport, so for packaging, actually the packaging, the purpose of the packaging is to protect sterile items from contamination. So it will be maintain the serenity of the instruments while transporting or before before the actual usage of the instrument. So for storage, the sterile storage process will, will begin soon after the sterilizer door is open. So once the sterilizer door is open, the storage process is, uh, will start. So the start of sterile storage process is when your sterilization uh, machine opens. So for storage of your different consumables, please be reminded and you need to segregate it. With your sterile, sterile, clean, clean, and then okay, uh, sterile and clean. Okay, for example, there are some uh, sterilized instruments that are purchased outside. Okay, so when purchased ster sterile supplies are received into the facility, you need to immediately store it. Okay. So this is your sample of your sterile packages. So aside from the one you process, you, you are processing the instruments, which is sterile, there are some um, purchase instruments, which is sterile, or purchase uh, consumables, which is sterile. For this one, this is your sterile sponge or gauze, sterile gauze. So you can, you can, uh, you can store this together with, with sterile instruments, okay? For your um, sterile cotton balls, this is the sample. Or if ever there are times that there is disposable instruments, which is sterile. So this is your sample. For example, this one, this is your dental instruments. So you can, you can place this to, together with the same instruments, sterile instruments. So sterile, sterile should be stored. Clean, clean should be stored. So this is the sample of your non-sterile. Okay. This is your non-sterile. Okay, this is your cotton balls. Sometimes it will become sterile if you will pouch it in a, a sterilization pouch and autoclave it. It will, it will become sterile. But if it is clean, you, you can uh, store it together with the clean items or clean consumables. These items is considered clean. These boxes is considered clean. And the contain is considered clean. This box is considered clean. And uh, your chemical indicator script is considered clean. So you cannot mix the other one, the previous one I show you with this one, okay? You will mix clean with clean instruments or clean consumables. Well, you, you need to mix sterile to sterile. So for storage, um, for logistic box, 
which means this is your box. So, for example, you receive one box of your pouches. For example, this one. You receive one box of this, to this one, okay? You cannot store this one in CSSD. The logistic box or the brown box, you cannot store it in CSSD. You can store whatever inside uh, the contain, whatever uh, consumables inside, whether uh, original boxes, you can store them. But for logistic box, you cannot store them because the logistic box is considered contaminated and dirty. So this is considered dirty due to transportation and handling issue. So that we don't know, logistic boxes are should not be stored in CSSP. So for this one, for example, this is the contents of your logistic box, then you can store it. For this one, you can store it. But for the brown box, you can store it. So for storage area, this is your um, CSSD shelf, okay? So your shelf should be 8 to 10 inches from the floor, which means for this area, for this area, it should be 8 to 10 inches, okay? It should be 8 to 10 inches from the floor. So when placing sterile pouches or packages, you need to check for the integrity of the pouch before placing it in the shelf. So you need to check the integrity before putting some instruments here or here or here. You need to check the integrity of the pouch from ster sterilizer to here. You need to check if the pouch, um, the indicator tape is not broken. Okay, if it is self-sealing pouches, if it is properly sealed, if there is no air pockets, if it is a rigid container, you need to check if the container locks are intact. Okay. So when you are removing, uh, when you are removing uh, packages or container or serial container or rigid container here on, on the shelf, you are not allowed to drag any instruments or packages. You need to lift it and drag, okay? Not automatically drag it. So lift and drag. So that's the protocol in uh, sterile storage. So for heavy equipment or heavy devices or heavy packages, you need to place them on the middle of of the shelf, okay? Not on, on the top or not on, on the lowest part of the shelf because once, once it's, it is heavy, your body mechanics will be, uh, will not be followed, okay? Once you are lifting the heavy objects, you cannot do the proper body mechanics of it. So try to put your heavy objects on the middle so that you can, it can facilitate you when removing the, those packages. So for your storage, you are not allowed actually um, to overstock any um, packages for this one. You are not allowed We're not allowed to overstock them. Okay. Supposedly, ideally, it should be one layer, as previously shown, per layer or per place. It should be one packages. Okay. For rigid container, you are allowed. You are allowed to overstock, but not too high. At least two, it's okay, but not not that high. Or three. It can damage the lower part of the rigid container. You need to check your IFU also if you are allowed to overstock. 
because sometimes it is not allowed to overstock. So do not overstock packages for liquid container. You can overstock them, but not on high, um, but not too high, as the weight may damage the lower container. It can damage the lower container, actually. We need to check the IFE. Even, um, so you need to check the IFE. For this one, you are not allowed because it can damage the pouches. The pressure is on the bottom part of the packages and it can damage the pouches. So this is a sample of your um, storage shelf in CSSB. Ideally, ideally for this lower part, it should be solid, the same as this one. Okay, it should be solid. If ever your um, your bottom part is not solid, then we can put a shelf liner. So the reason why it should be solid because you need to protect the instruments or packages from contamination when cleaning the environment or when doing uh, the cleaning, especially on the floor. Okay, so. It should have a uh, what do you call this shelf liner if you if this one is not possible. This is the idea. So this is a sample of your shelf liner. Okay, this is a sample of your shelf liner. So that we can protect the look, the bottom part of your packages once there uh, somebody is cleaning the CSSB or if someone is cleaning the floor it will, your packages will not be contaminated so products remains remain sterile until an event occur to make them unsterile so that's event related sterility so there are two types of uh, uh, related sterility which is your event-related and your time-related sterility. Event-related, your pouches, packages is sterile unless the integrity of the packages is questionable. Okay, If it is intact, it's okay, the packages is okay, there's no moist, there's no wet, then it is sterile. Okay. So time-related sterility, as a specific expiration date are issued per package depending on local regulation or company policy. It depends, okay, on local regulation. For example, here in UAE, in, in Abu Dhabi, the, the local the local regulation, which is the DOH, they are uh, following the three months rule. Okay? If it is sing, single pouch, it, it should be one month. If it is um, double pouch, it should be three months. They have those policies. Okay. But most of the items, general items, it's three months policy. But there are some um, institutions like MOH, DHT, here in UAE, they are allowing a one year time related study. So for transport, uh, mode of transportation of your soiled or clean instruments, for example, your uh, sterile instruments, you need to transport it to uh, the clinical areas or OR. So there are two types of uh, transport, which is your closed and open, okay? This is the sample of your closed, which means there it is contained to protect the Packages and pouches against any contaminants when delivering the instrument. Well, for this one, for example, this is your op um, open, this is your closed. Sometimes they are placing it here. Okay. With dust cover, then it is prone for contamination, vulnerable for contamination. So the open the open cart is vulnerable for contamination.
So for stock rotation, let's be reminded by FIFO or first in, first out. So whatever uh, you receive first, it should be uh, issued first. Okay. So whatever the earliest, the expiration, it should be issued first. So the first in, first out, the newest item is on the left. Sometimes they are doing that one. The newest item is on the left, and on the right is the older item. So either with expiration date or with manufacturing date. If ever there is an expiration date, you need to check the expiration date. So the first in, first out will be followed by the uh, expiration date. Because there are times that your supplier, for example, the last month issue will expire 2020, uh, 2022, and this month issued consumables will expire on 2020. So you need to check them and you need to follow whatever the earliest the expiry, you need to use it right away. Um, for manufacturing date, you need to check the manufacturing date because not all packages have the expiration date. Sometimes it will just say the manufacturing date. You need to check sometimes uh, it said it says uh, five years from the manufacturing. Okay, you need to count. So for storage um, in CSSD, so as I early discussed earlier, whatever sterile, it should be sterile. So whatever clean, it should be clean. So whatever uh, chemicals, it should be separated with chemicals. Uh, chemical storage, I mean. You cannot store the chemicals in clean, clean consumables or other consumables. It should be separated with uh, designated storage location for chemicals only. So documentation and record keeping. For documentation and record keeping, this is very essential because uh, in CS department, you need to check whether or not you are compliant with the standard and regulations. So documentation is very essential in CS department from department physical aspects, cleanliness, temperature, humidity, humidity from decontamination to storage area. Whatever um, parameters need to be checked, you need to document it. So documentation is actually a requirement. It is not an option, but a necessity. So a valid proof or evidence that indicates your CS department, your department, and processes met by a standard protocols set by health authority. So this is also used to improve the flow of uh, your workflow. So the importance of accurate records you need to um, be familiarized. The importance of accurate record is your Mac A or your Mac Apple, which means your it is mandatory. Okay. That's why I showed a laptop, which is Mac, Apple Mac or Mac. Apple, so mandatory, accurate with your importance of accurate records, so which it is mandatory, it is accurate, it should be complete, and audited. So the importance of your accurate record should be Mac A or Mac Apple should be mandatory, accurate, complete, and audited. So the records are kept to document many processes and the conditions in the CS department, including serialization cycles, PPM, routine, keep and testing, and cleaning. So facts about record keeping in CS department should be mandatory. It is mandatory. Okay. So,
The next is accurate. The record must be accurate. So information must be documented as it is, even if the information indicates a process uh, has failed. You need to document it, even if it is failed, because you need to check whatever you can do. For example, uh, your biological indicator failed. It turns to yellow. Your process biological indicator turns to yellow. You need to document it. And you need to do some action or action plan. What you need to do. You need to repeat two times for biological indicator, a total of three. Okay? To check if there's really a problem with your um, sterilization method or your autoclave. So by doing the three, then you need to recall. So that's, it should be accurate and do some action. So record must be complete. So record should be audited routinely. So there is, as for the new guidelines of CSSB, um, there should be one, okay, one direct supervisor will, which will supervise the processes in uh, sterilization department. He or she needs to be a CSSB technician or a registered nurse with a certi which is certified with ASHAMS. So general monitoring in CSSB, you are different types of um, general mon monitoring in CSSB. So CS technicians should continually monitor their environment to help ensure that the integrity of the each work area and the process performed in those areas are maintained. So formal monitoring of fiscal environment, there are room temperature monitoring, humidity monitoring, to ensure facility meet the established uh, standard. So this is a sample of your um, CSSD temperature, humidity, and air exchanges. We already discussed this um, on, I think, first or second lecture. Okay, so please be reminded because we discussed already the ETO, okay? For your decontamination, it has 10 air exchanges, okay? And the air pressure for this one, it should be negative. For your general work area, it should be positive. For your sterilization storage area, it should be positive. Your sterilization equipment through, it should be positive. But it will go, uh, it will be as negative if you are using what, ETO or ethylene oxide. And sometimes they are using uh, facilities, sometimes are using autoclave and ETO. Okay, if there is an ETO, it should be separated with different room, not the same with the autoclave machine. So ETO, if you are if they are using ETO, so the room should be negative air pressure. So negative air pressure, so that your ETO is a hazardous or toxic substance or toxic gas. Okay, if in case there is a leakage, the reason why it should be negative, so that the the toxic air cannot escape on the decontamination room. Uh, on the steril sterilization equipment room and cannot contaminate contaminate other rooms. So if you are using only um, what do you call that? If you are using um, autoclave, you are using hydrogen peroxide, you, you are using ozone, it should be positive air uh, pressure. But if you are using ETO, it should be negative. So expiring monitoring lab and disposal lab. So upon receiving of the consumables items, um, all item description, that number and expiry should be properly monitored from initial stocking in and restocking of consumable items. So disposal, if ever there are items that, that, that 
and it's expired, you need to dispose it properly. So it's either uh, what's the company protocols and policy with the disposal of your uh, expired items. For the disposal need is the stuff disposed in yellow sharp B, referred to infection control as per policy for proper disposal. Or it will be uh, discarded in yellow plastic B and it will be labeled with expired uh, consumables or expired items. So for your water quality test, so as per the new updates, water quality will impact every process in the decontamination area. So cleaning chemicals must be used with the recommended water pH. Hard water will cause scale to form on equipment, reducing the equipment cleaning effectiveness. So water is the most widely used raw materials in CSSD. So you need to ensure that medical devices doesn't acquire additional endotoxin before sterilization. That's the reason why you need to check, you need to monitor the water quality of uh, whatever water you are using in CSSP. So it will prevent damage or corrosion to the medical device. So this is a sample of your utility water and critical, uh, critical, critical water. This is the recommended level of water. So, for the pH of hardness, it should be below 150 for critical water. Uh, for critical water, it should, uh, sometimes you are using pure water, critical water, or distilled water. While you need the water, you are referring to tap water or the ionized water. So as you can see in the recommended level of water, actually we already discussed this with, uh, on the previous topic, okay? So, as you can see, the, the critical water, which is the distilled water, they are asking the pH of 5 to 7. Okay, 5 to 7. Usually, for pure water or your distilled water, it should be neutral. should be neutral. So the, as per the recommended level in CSSB in e shops, it's five to seven for critical water. But sometimes there are times, for example, the accepted level for the neutral is actually on this green line to on this um On, on this green line to here, okay? But if you, they will say if it is neutral, it is supposedly seven. But sometimes uh, they will not give a seven, uh, pH of seven. So the ideal is either here or here will be considered as your neutral. Okay, which means it is 6.5 to 7.5. Okay, as neutral. So, two categories of water utility water comes from the top. So they are calling it as 
uh, tap water, but for free rinsing, it should be because utility water is actually not ideal for free rinsing. It should be deionized water. For critical water, it should be pure water, distilled water, and deionized water. So water that is sensibly treated to ensure microorganisms and inorganic and organic materials are removed, including bacteria. So mechanical cleaning equipment cavitation for decontamination area monitoring. For your ultrasonic machine, you are checking the machine remove the cavitation process, you are che checking it with oil test or sono check. Okay, we already discussed this um, in the first or second lecture. So for mechanical cleaning cavitation, you are checking with the oil test and sono check. You need to check if the cavitation process is uh, working or not. So for foil test, it should be uh, submerged for 60 seconds and it should be perforated. Okay? The foil should be per perforated. For solo check, from green or blue initial color, it will change to yellow. So there's a vial or a glass vial or ampule, it depends on the manufacturer, you need to submerge it in the ultrasonic machine, and then uh, run it for 60 seconds, and it will change from initial color green or blue to yellow. So it is different from your biological equipment. For a process challenge device, it is designed to challenge a serialization cycle. Yes, uh, this box may be commercially prepared or made at the healthcare facility. So this is sample of your Bowie and Big Test. Serializer printouts, once it is done, um, your serializer printouts, your main responsibility is to check the receipt or the printouts. You need to check the temperature if it reaches 121 to 135 degrees. Okay, you need to check um, the drying cycle. You need to check the, the consistent temperature or uh, the exposure, heat exposure. So you need to check it before opening. You need to check the serializer printout before opening the machine. So staff credentials are one of the requirements in CSSD. It should be placed on, on the CSSD room. So, there should be a training certificate. Staff should be trained in all equipment and procedure needed in CS department. So for training certificate, all equipment, all devices, the, uh, the staff or the CSS technician must be trained before handling or before operating those equipment. Infection control policy or certificate, it is mandatory for uh, CSS technician to, to get an infection control training before the actual job or before initiating the task in CSSP. Bloodborne pathogen training, it is mandated since uh, CSSP is dealing with blood. Chemical spill management, since we are dealing with chemicals, it should be uh, trained and you, are, uh, you, sh you should be trained in chemical spill management. At B tighter, no CSSP technician are allowed start processing without heavy title. Okay, infection control policy. Um, there should be a copy for a C the CSS technician must read all the infection control policy. Okay. And there should be a acknowledgement receipt or acknowledgement page that you read, approve that you read the, the policy. For CSSD policy, it's the same. The CSSD policy is a workplace policies and procedures, establish boundaries, guidelines, and the best practice for CSSD. For your PPM, it's plant preventive maintenance. You need to check what machine is that, when is the last PPM, and when is the next PPM. So the lot number is there. What is the machine name? 
and when is the last PPM and when is the next PPM. So for your MSDS, it should be uh, kept in CSSD since you are dealing with chemicals. For MSDS, it, your material safety data sheet, this is um, compiled um, data for your chemicals. So your MSDS file has seven, nine categories of information. Okay, so the product information, product identifier, the emergency contact number, the address, it should be there. The, the first aid procedures or protocols, it should be there. Um, what else? Your hazardous ingredients, what is the ingredients of your chemicals, it should be in your MSDS. What is the fire and explosion data hazard? If it is um, fire or explosive um, chemicals, reactivity data, Toxicological uh, properties, which is it can cause respiratory effect, or it can uh, it is a carcinogen, and that it should be treated. First aid measures, preparation information, and um, so let's do the practice test. So do not choose or look for the familiar words or answer. You should read each question and note important details. Read each options and rationalize one by one. Eliminate as per your rationalization. Choose on at least two of your choices. You need to practice this well. Even at home, you need to practice this well. In answering true or false, find the word or statement that makes, makes it false. Do not rely only by answering false without knowing why it became false. So question number one, Puri purified water should have a pH in what range? Purified water should have a pH in what range? Okay, what's the answer for that one? I actually discussed this. Okay, let's start. For your 7.5 to 8, it is neutral to alkaline. For your 5 to 6, this is acidic. Though, it is, though 5 and 6 is still acceptable, but if you if you are checking with uh with that with the chart, it is acidic. For your six, the six point five, this is consider acidic. I mean acidic to neutral. Okay. This case consider as your neutral. So your answer is letter C. You need to go back with the chart which I discussed. So puri purified water should have a pH in what range? 6.5 to 7.5. So 
So 6.5 to 7. Purified water should have a pH of 6.5 to 7.5. The acidity or alkalinity of the water plays an important role in cleaning because the water interacts with the products that also have a specific pH level. If the pH of water and the product being clean are the same, the pH will not change. However, if they are different, they will change. The next question is, which is the chemical is used primarily on skin? Okay, this is your disinfectant. Which chemicals is used primarily on the skin? So which chemical is used primarily on the skin? Is it A, fluorine, B, bromine, C, iodine, and D, chlorine? So if you're answering um, this question, you need to check, okay? For example, chemical use uh, in the skin. So this is, should be either disinfectant or, I mean, antiseptic. These three, and this four is actually a halogen family. Okay. All are halogen family. So let's start with fluorine. Let's, let's eliminate. I'm not familiar with this one, so I will eliminate it. So fluorine is actually a poisonous gas. Your bromine is Has a what about offensive odor and suffocating odor. So I will, um, the option left is iodine and chlorine. Okay. So what's the answer? Okay, your iodine, your chlorine is low level to high level. Disinfectant. Okay, remember the CPAC, the abbreviation CPAC I, I, I discussed before. For low level, to, I, I mean that's not high level, it is low level to um, uh, it's not high level.
So these all are halogens. I'm not familiar with that too, but I will discuss which. This is a toxic, toxic gas. This is um, offensive and suffocating water. Your iodine is your chlorine. Let's go for chlorine. It is not an option because it is a low level disinfection. Or instruments, okay. So, and chlorine is a skin irritant. It cannot be used on the skin. So your iodine is actually a antiseptic. So the answer is, let me see. You need to actually, guys. You need to answer it one by one because might change the question and it will ask for example in glory okay remember the the low level and mid level which is the sipa or low level and intermediate your sipa is low level which is your chlorine i will do four um, phenolics, alcohol, and quaternary. For your high level, which is your go pH, okay, glutardehyde, or totaldehyde. And your hydrogen peroxide. What's the P? Actually, I forgot the P. I forgot the P for go pH for your high level disinfectant, but the abbreviation is go pH. For CPAP, is chlorine, iodoform, phenolics, alcohol, and quaternary, ammonium. For your go pH, is glutardehyde or total dehyde and hydrogen peroxide. Okay, you need to remember that one. Just a moment, I'll check. Okay, um, your P or your go pH is
So, we have made it before as GoPage or GoHP. So, Pera City Cassie. You need to check, you need to, you need to be familiarized with this abbreviation because you can easily, um, uh, you can easily remember those if you are uh, using the abbreviation, which is CPAC and GoPH. For CPAC, it's chlorine, iodoporphenolics, phenolics, alcohol, and quaternary ammonia. For GoPH, it's glutardehyde or tautaldehyde and peracetic acid and your hydrogen peroxide. So, which chemical is used primarily on the skin? It's iodine. Iodine is the heaviest of the commonly occurring halogen. It's the heaviest because the weight of iodine is heavy in periodic table of elements. It is used primarily as an antiseptic on skin. They are commonly used as the final preparation of the skin before injection or surgical incision. So, this is a sample of your. Um, Periodic table of elements. I'm not saying you need to memorize this, but you need to familiarize with that. Okay, this is your halogens. Okay, that's your fluorine, fluorine, um, bromine, iodine, and um, astatine. Astatine, I think that's astatine. So this is. Uh, halogen, actually they are halogen, include this one, but I'm not familiar with this one. All of this one are halogen family. The iodine is the heaviest. I'm not familiar with the weight of the halogen, but I think it's page 100 plus. Okay, I think it's 150. 150, like that. So halogens are categorized as which uh, level of disinfectant? Is it low level, intermediate level, or high level, or super, super high level? Halogens categorized as which level of disinfectant? Low level, intermediate, intermediate level, high level, or super high level? Okay, let's start. Halogens, level of disinfectant, okay? There is no super high level, actually. It's not high level. Why? What is your high level? Your OPH. Or your glutardehyde, or total dehyde, um, uh, parasitic acid, and your hydrogen peroxide. For your low level, that's possible. That's possible. For low level, that's possible. 
for intermediate level, that's possible. Okay. For your low level, for your low, for your low level, to intermediate or mid. Abbreviation is CPAC. Okay. Chlorine, iodopor, um, phenolics, alcohol, and quaternary amount. We already discussed this on the first, I think, third or fourth lecture. For your you are considered as low level to intermediate level, okay? But for your chlorine, iodocor. Okay, for this one, and this one, that's why the, the I guess. for this one, okay, for this one, that's the reason why we abbreviate it CPA. So for your chlorine, iodophore, and chlorine and iodophore, they are your halogens. Okay, your chlorine is your I will start with phenolics. Your phenolics is your your phenolics is your low to intermediate. Your chlorine is considered as intermediate. Your alcohol and quaternary ammonia is considered as low level. It can actually be both low level to intermediate, but this is the ideal um, level of this uh, level of disinfectant. Okay, that's why we abbreviate it before with CPAP because the middle is your low to intermediate, while your chlorine and iodophore is your intermediate, specifically as intermediate. Well, your alcohol and quaternary is your low level. Okay. If I can uh, go back to the previous lecture, I, I'll check if I can still open it.
So this is the one. You see? So they are considered, as you can see on the previous lecture, which is, I think it is chapter 8. As you can see, okay, the disinfection there is low level, intermediate, and high level. So the highest is the sterilization already. So it's not part of disinfection. So as you can see, there are low level and intermediate level, but there are specific low level and intermediate level um, chemicals, which is we abbreviate as CPA, which is chlorine, iodophores, um, phenolics, alcohol, and your quaternary ammonia. Your chlorine and iodophores, it is intermediate. Your quinolix is intermediate and low. That's why we put the we put the phenolics in the middle. Your alcohol and quaternary is your low level uh, disinfectant. Okay, so you need to you need to go back to this one. So halogens are categorized as which level of disinfectant? Halogens are intermediate level disinfectant that have similar elements, possessing some unique properties. The family is known for its reactivity in two members, which is chlorine and iodophores. So that's it. So instruments uh, decontamination begin in which of the following places? So decontaminating instruments which uh, area it will start? Is it, it will start in prep, prep area? Or it will start at the point of use? It will start at the contamination area? Or as soon as leaving that area in which the instrument was used? So instrument decontamination, Begin in which following places? Okay, so let's start annotating. So I will start with letter D. It's wrong. Why? As soon as leaving. Before you leave, you need to decontaminate it. So you need to prepare it before transport. Prep area with decontamination area. Prep area are not allowed to be mixed with decontamination area. So decontamination area rinsing station. Rinsing station, which means you already done the um, manual brushing. Okay. So this question mark. Actually, this is wrong. So the answer is point of use. The user or the nurse should decontaminate your instrument prior sending it to CSSD or prior prior placing the instrument to the transport card. So instrument decontamination begins in which of the following places? Point of use. Instrument decontamination begins at point of use and is then continued in central service decontamination area. Central service personnel must enlist the help of user department to ensure that instrument and equipment are prepared for the decontamination process immediately after use. So 
So next, disinfectant kills microorganisms. They can also block, eliminate the spread of all diseases, eliminate the need for PPE, kill all spore form of bacteria, be harmful to the cells of the human body. Disinfectant kills my microorganism. They can also block. Uh, they can also block. Okay, so let's try to answer it each question. So disinfectant kills microorganism. Okay. It's either a low level or high level. Okay. So I will start with letter A. Does it eliminate the spread of all diseases? All diseases? No. All diseases? No. Okay. Usually, guys, if they are using oil, it is false. So usually, it's not oil because it, this is only disinfectant. So kill all spore. Again, it's all. All spore form of bacteria. It cannot kill spore. Disinfectant cannot kill spore. Okay? Only sterilization can kill spore. Eliminate the need of PPE. Okay, so it will not eliminate the wear of PPE because you are disinfected. We still need to wear PPE. Even handling disinfectant, you need to wear PPE. Even disinfecting your uh, equipment or any where, uh, environmental surfaces, you need to wear PPE. Still, you need to wear PPE. Be harmful to human. Uh, to the cells of the human body. So this is nice. Okay. We need to read each questions and eliminate it one by one. Do not answer one by one. Okay. We need to weigh each question and then cross out, cross out, rationalize each and cross out. Anyway, we will have a practice questions. We need practice questions. I think 50 questions in one session. So, this is, disinfectant kills microorganisms. They can also be harmful to the cells of the human body. So, if disinfectant kills microorganisms. They can also be harmful to the cells of the human body. Personnel should take precaution to avoid direct contact with these chemicals. Still, we need to wear PPE. Next question Ideally, which type of wetting agent should be utilized as the free rinsing uh, agent to minimize the deposits of minerals? In that appears as water spots when dry. Said as wet, wetting agent, pre rinsing agent to minimize deposit, to minimize deposit of minerals. What's the answer? Is it A, residual cleaning chemicals? Letter B, disinfectant? Letter C, sanitizer? Letter D, deionized water? Okay, I will start with Disinfectant. This is not already a free rinsing. The question is a free rinsing agent. 
okay, when exposed to any chemicals, you need to read the instrument, okay, to remove any impurities or remaining chemicals. So residual cleaning chemicals, a free rinsing. Sanitizer is not even a free rinsing. Is the ionized water. So your free rinsing is, you need to remember this, it's the ionized water. Sometimes the, if there's no the ionized water, it said as utility water. And critical water. Uh, I mean, top one. But it should be the ionized one. Ideally, it should be the ionized one. So, ideally, the ionized water should be utilized as the free rinsing agent to minimize the deposit of minerals that appears as water spots when dry. So I think we are done with the lecture. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions, guys? So for those who wants to take the exam, it's either this month, you need to finish the Steris uh, University account. You need to finish all the lecture and all the certificate. I'm, I'm monitoring all the uh, progress, both um, Steris and Ishams, uh, I mean for do. And once you have those, I'm, I'm focusing on for do. The Steris is only your um, reinforcement. Okay, so I'm focusing on for do. So focus, uh, the progress test will be, fin uh, will be available on 15. 16 of this month. So once it is available, you can take the final uh, progress test and finish your Steris account because the information is very detailed on Steris. So it can facilitate your learning. So do you have any question? So if none, I think I need to finish and close the session for today. So let's meet again on 15th of February. Thank you, guys. Thank you.